The final topic of our HTML5 presentation is on cross-origin resource sharing. So earlier in the presentation, we looked at the same origin policy and one of the examples that we saw in that was we could make requests from one origin to another, but we could not read the response. The same origin policy prevented that. However, in some cases, uh, just in the same way as we may want to communicate between iframes, we may want to allow cross-origin communication between domains that we trust. And so taking the Google example again, uh, a Gmail application or a Google Plus application may wish to make a bi-directional communication with another Google asset. Uh, as long as those domains are trusted, as long as those origins are trusted, um, the application developer may you know, accept that and allow that as part of the design. So cross-origin resource sharing allows us to do that. It allows us to define an access control list and say these origins are allowed to make bi-directional communications with one another. And this is all done through a series of um, HTTP headers. Um, typically speaking, an application uh, will pre-flight any request that it makes uh, to a cause-enabled endpoint. And that essentially means rather than sending a GET or a POST request to issue the, the requested action, it begins by sending an OPTIONS request and it reads back these headers to determine what it is, and isn't, is allowed and isn't allowed to do. So to cover how these headers work, we'll cover each of these headers in turn. Um, and the first uh, before we do that, um, just briefly, um, where would we use cause, you know, where and how is it used? There are a number of different areas. Um, HCTP, uh, XML HTTP request is an API call that we'll, we will typically use for AJAX requests in JavaScript. And so that allows us to make requests uh, to other resources and, and read out responses. And this is the area we will focus on today. This is the most common, uh, commonly encountered method of performing cause requests. The cause is supported for loading fonts, loading web fonts uh, within CSS, uh, using within WebGL textures and images drawn uh, on a canvas using draw image. And whilst uh, it's possible for those things to, to have vulnerabilities, um, most of what we're concerned with is, is, where, is having a JavaScript being able to make a request to a, an origin outside of its own uh, and receive and read the response. So the first header uh, of interest is the access control allow origin. And this header dictates which origins are allowed to, to read responses from the request. And there are two options here. We can either specify a specific origin or list of origins to say these origins are permitted, or we can permit any origin using a wildcard character using the asterisk. So um, one of the important um, components um, to this attack and to, to, to cause would be um, the access control allow credentials header. So this dictates whether or not the browser is permitted to use cookies within the cause request. And from an attacker point of view, this is all, almost always gonna be required. Um, well, if we want to make a request from one origin to another, let's say a malicious attacker has embedded a JavaScript in a malicious website. They want to make a request to your internet bank, or to your Facebook account, hoping that you're logged in. They want to retrieve information that belongs to you, your, your authentication information, sensitive user-specific information. And they're only going to be able to do that if your browser will include its cookies um, at, you know, to, to, so the, the endpoint can recognize your user account and supply that information. So this header is important and it's required to, to allow cookies. An important aspect of this and something which does help us um, in terms of security is if the endpoint uh, defines a wildcard character to say any site may perform a cause request, then this header is ignored uh, or is not effective. So if, uh, if we're allowing anybody to connect and the, um, and, and, your, and the browser is sending its cookies, then we can't receive the response. It's just the browser will just deny it as part of its, uh, as part of its policy. So how does this become vulnerable then? Um, it's very similar to the common programming pattern we looked at um, for post message. This is where we have a, we have a remote endpoint that, that is cause enabled. And rather than only allowing one specific origin to access it, it has a requirement to allow several origins. So if you look at um, Google, uh, they have lots of different web properties on different domains. They may want to maintain a list of domains that they allow. Uh, when the request comes in, that request has an origin header saying, this is where, um, where we are connecting from. Um, the other can then check that list and check that origin header and say, do I allow requests from here? And if I do, I'll echo that back as an allowed origin. 
So this is, uh, for example, let's say this is a request to Google um, from appcheckng.com. If we make a cause request, it will include in the HTTP request header an origin header, uh, and it will it will say it will list the uh, origin that we're currently loaded within. The server then may check that against a whitelist uh, or a valid uh, some other method of validation and say, "Do I allow the origin?" If I do, um, echo that back in the access control allowed origin header. And this is a, a really a relatively common pattern that we see for cause endpoints. The vulnerability is in the validation. If the validation fails, if we can trick the validation, then we may be able to exploit a vulnerability. So validation uh, vulnerabilities, we've already covered them briefly in today's presentation. Um, your mileage may vary to why these occur. The, it's design flaws. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a, a, you know, a, a misinterpretation of, of, of how the validation routine works, a, a flaw within the validation procedure, or just a complete lack of validation. Um, so we've seen all of these things. Uh, an example would be um, we have a cause endpoint. It has the facility to validate um, origins against an allowed list, but that hasn't been enabled um, for testing purposes or, 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 or just simply completely absent. Uh, another would be that the origin, uh, the origin check-in is just flawed. Uh, so in, in our previous example, we had a regular expression. Um, it looks okay to begin with, but the fact uh, in this case, again, uh, HTTP or HTTPS, um, the developer in this case just assumed that we would then validate to only allow mail.google.com. But because dots uh, mean any character within a regular expression, we were able to bypass this um, by just replacing a dot with, with any character. As long as we could register the domain that, that matched that pattern, uh, we could bypass that validation routine. There are others, as we've looked at, things that just check for the existence of a string within the tested origin. Uh, we may be able to append a parent domain. Um, and you know, the, it's, it's about exploring the validation routine and, and trying to find a flaw within that. There is another vulnerability that could be exploited along with this, um, something that uh, known as header injection. This is where we are able to embed um, new lines um, in, in a requested parameter to embed uh, HTTP headers within the response. Um, this is another vulnerability that AppCheck will pick up for you, will detect automatically. And essentially it will allow us to send a request and in, uh, when the response comes back from the request, we embed some, some headers of our own creation in the response to trick the browser into thinking that they were valid cause headers. Um, for those of you familiar with header injection, although it's a relatively common vulnerability, the most common place to find it is in a redirect. Um, where the location header is written from user supplied input. Um, it's key to point out that from a cause perspective, if, if a redirect does occur, um, the final destination of that redirect has, m must also supply the, the vulnerable cause header uh, before it's effective. So if we, we can issue a, a cause header within the redirect, but if that header then disappears in its final destination, um, this attack uh, falls down. There's a link there to the Open Web Application Security Project that talks about exploiting header injection vulnerabilities for uh, HTTP response splitting. The principle here is, 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 is almost the same, um, just a, a different approach to the attack. Um, but yeah, it's relatively rare to find uh, a resource with header injection with something um, useful to, to extract, but it's, it's, it's definitely possible. So it's, it's worth looking out for. And as I said, um, AppCheck will, will detect that automatically. So demo time. Uh, this is a very simple demo. Um, we're gonna go back to the initial um, cause HTML file that we showed earlier on. Uh, we need to just make sure that we're logged into FacePalm um, again. And this is gonna send a HTTP request, uh, a cause request. I will show you how that request looks. Okay, send a message to the FacePalm uh, inner iframe that is um, that is also vulnerable to uh, to a cause vulnerability. We're sending from attacker.nsa.gov. So when I send this request, if I go and take a look at what that, what, how that appears, we can see that um, because this is a cause request, our HTTP request from the browser has included the current origin in which we reside. The remote server has echoed back the origin and its allowed list, and it's also allowing us to use cookies. 
if this was using an asterisk, the browser wouldn't allow us to receive the response because it wouldn't. It said it would realize we're using cookies, but it's also an asterisk. It's also a wildcard, so we can't allow that. Um, but because we've defined a specific origin, it simply echoed the, the the one that we've requested, and we're allowing credentials. We're able to read this message that was uh, intended for the uh, intended for a valid authenticated user. So AppCheck and G will detect um, this vulnerability. Um, it will detect post message uh, vulnerabilities. It will also detect uh, cross origin resource sharing vulnerabilities. Uh, among many of the checks that it does, it will also um, attempt to take the current origin of the target application and perform some common um, validation bypass techniques to, to see if we can bypass any um, validation performed on the server. Again, this is an example. If we, we, we use a regular expression um, similar to the Google example where the dots were erroneously, um, uh, they weren't escaped to mean actual dots, instead mean any character, we'll, we'll substitute out the dots for, a, for an alpha character. Uh, we'll also try and append a parent domain. This is looking for those index of style situations where we're looking for the existence of a trusted origin within the tested value rather than the, you know, doing an absolute test. The null value, um, this was an interesting case um, that we encountered where a developer of a desktop application wanted to load uh, local HTML and, do, uh, and then request um, via cross-origin resource sharing resources from an online server. When you do that, when a, when a resource is loaded locally, it sends an origin of null. Now, this clearly isn't a security boundary. It just means that it doesn't have a, a, an origin that the browser recognizes as a valid origin, so it sends null. But in the, the, the application developer, in this case, um, used that as a security check to say, well, in this case, the, the resource has been loaded locally. Um, somebody's opened up a local HTML file um, and therefore will allow communication. Uh, so we also do a whole other range of checks to bypass common validation routines. Uh, these are just three examples. So in terms of remediation, um, it's a case of just avoiding those configuration weaknesses. Um, if we are going to allow uh, cross-origin resource sharing, just ensure that that list of trusted domains is in fact valid. Um, that any validation you perform on the inbound header, it, you know, it cannot be cannot be bypassed. Um, if we're going to use the asterisk to allow any um, site to connect to our application. We can only really serve uh, content uh, to, a modern, to a modern web browser that isn't based upon a, an authenticated session. So generally speaking, this is a, a, of limited use to the attacker. There have been some, some documented examples um, where, for example, you have a, um, an intranet website um, that, is that isn't accessible from the internet. But a malicious attacker um, could coerce an internal user into visiting a malicious website. That malicious website then issues cause requests to the internal intranet server. If that intranet server allows all origins to access it, it will then serve back content. The malicious website could then read and read that and exfiltrate the data out to the internet. So in other words, it would allow an internal, an external attacker to access an, an extranet site, albeit from an unauthenticated perspective. So you know, threat scenarios exist. It's far more dangerous, however, if uh, if we have a, a specific origin that we can we can corrupt, we can bypass validation of, and cookies are allowed. So that concludes our presentation on HTML5 security. There obviously are lots of other areas we were unable to go into today. Um, if you'd like to know uh, more on HTML5, if you visit our website, we'll be updating with some further examples. We also um, run a regular seminar up and down the UK. Uh, which has content like this. Uh, we also cover cross-site scripting, SQL injection, common uh, content management system vulnerabilities in WordPress, Joomla, Magento, uh, attacking upload components, um, and a whole host of other web application vulnerabilities. It's free to attend, uh, so feel free to get in touch and we can book you on the next, uh, the next uh, seminar. If you have a specific question, uh, please drop me a line. Uh, either direct message me on Twitter or drop me an email. Uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you have. Um, other than that, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. Thank you very much.